our, our um, satisfaction comes from the fact that if we have a problem that, that fits this setup, then we know that we can do the maximum a posteriori inference at test time. For training, uh, maybe someone hands you a bunch of good uh, unary costs and pairwise costs, or maybe you learn them, ideally you learn them from some training data. Uh, but once you've trained, you now know how to do the map inference for a chain. So we go on and we say, well, actually, the same algorithm, more or less, can be used for trees. Uh, now, trees, we'll see uh, later today, trees are very useful uh, because, well, it expands the, the range of possibilities, the range of possible problems that we can do inference on. Uh, in this in this way that guarantees that we're getting the optimal combination of, of states. Um, if we take this this graph and we factorize it, uh, we get the equation down here at the bottom, right? Where you should be able to do this already, right? You can see probability of w1 is there at the beginning, it has no parents. W3 has no parents either, right? And so on, where we have uh, all the dependencies listed, where. The interesting thing, obviously, the hard part about this, why this is different than what we did yesterday, is that we've got W5. And the probability of W5 is uh, contingent on W2 and w 4 state. So this is where the trickiness comes in. Our chains are in our way of solving for the optimal combination of states when we have a chain. It is based on the idea that we can divide this, this big problem with combinatorial uh, list of possible solutions into submodular problems. Right? It's, it's, a sub, it's submodular, we can divide it uh, up and just look at two nodes at a time, two random variables at a time, and just compute what are locally the best choices of parameters, uh, sorry, of, of values. And we can write that down and then move over and move over and keep keep doing this, basically solving a bunch of little problems, which, when you combine them at the end, gives us the answer to the bigger problem. What is the overall combination of states that, that is optimal? Here, we want to do the same thing, and we're going to, again, work from left to right, but we're going to have to do something slightly different when we get to W5. All right. So. Um, Essentially, we're, we're going to do the same setup as before. We convert our probabilities and where we were maximizing them into negative log probabilities that we want to minimize. minimize. There we go. OK. So uh, now we're maximizing the log probabilities, or we're minimizing uh, the negative log probabilities. So instead of worrying about probabilities or potentials, both of them we want them to be big, we want to worry about the costs, and we'll make them we want to make them small. U for unary cost, we've seen that before. P for pairwise cost, we've seen that before. T for three-way cost, right? Uh, so this is going to be this new, this new cost function that we have to kind of invent in, uh, in order to deal with, with W5 up there. All right. So. Uh, someone hands you a tree, you say, well, how do I, how do I pick this thing up? Uh, the answer is you pick it up by the leaves. You put the leaves over on the left, and you put the, the root of the tree over on the right, and, and you're ready to go. So we'll, uh, we'll worry about W5 when we get there. Initially, we just do what we did yesterday uh, for n equals 1. We go through and just fill in the minimum total cost so far, which is just writing in the unary for each of those for each of those bubbles. We do the same thing here for N3, just write in the, the unaries. We proceed using the same algorithm we've used so far. When we get here, we say, okay, what is the cheapest path for getting to this bubble, right? I have to take this unary cost, 1.7, add 2.0, and compare whether 3.7 is cheaper than 0.3. And it's it's not, so 0.3 wins, we say that's the winner, and we write that in here, adding on the, the new unary costs encountered at that bubble. So, so far, everything is fine, 
except that when we get to the three-way junction, we're going to have to be a little bit more clever. We have to look at the possible paths, the ways of reaching this state that, that exists, and we can't just look at these four arrows and say, oh, I'm just going to pick the, the cheapest combination of, of accumulated costs that comes in through each of them. Instead, what we need to do is we need to pick, pick one each from the ones coming from up there, from n equals 2. So we have to pick one of these, and we have to pick one of these. Because there are two here and two here, right? There are four configurations that we have to look at, right? You can obviously pair that, that one up there, the blue one that I'm pointing to, with either one of these two, and vice versa with the, with the purple. That means that we're implying that our, our three-way cost now is something that we've trained, we've looked up, someone's given it to us, somehow we have the information. And so you could think of it as represented in this way. So let me, let's, let's go here to, um, which one was I pointing to? Uh, for T5, uh, so this is our tertiary cost for node 5, for this one. If we look at uh, T5 for W5 equals 4, so that's this bottom one that I was just pointing to, we could store our, our not pairwise, but three-way costs in this sort of table where we're saying, okay, I, uh, I'm not sure that was an agreement or not. Uh, okay, so uh, we see W2 can take one of four values. Well, we, we know that, right? It, it, there are four uh, different places that, that messages can come in, can come from in, in N2. Clearly, we've sort of discounted the first and the second one, right? That's because the costs are infinite. Uh, and then we've got four different values of W4 as well. And so for each of them, we have to write in the potential cost. So what you should see here is that we've, we've got this three-way cost, and we've got some real numbers here for saying, OK, uh, imagine connect W5 with W2 um, by giving W2 the, the state of 3. And if you do that and you give W, you, you come from W4 equals 4, so this one, that's this, this purple one, uh, that'll be uh, a cost of 1.7. So you have, to, you have to look at the combination of possible paths that might lead here but you're looking simultaneously at, okay, which is the cheaper thing? I know I have to sample, I have to look at the, the, the connection to W2 and the connection to W4, and I have to look at which one of these is, is the cheapest. Notice, right, we're saying, ah, uh, these other ones are infinity, and that's why we don't have any edges, for instance, going to this bubble from node 4 equals the second state. Otherwise, we would have another edge here. So someone has given us this information, and now we can look up which is the, the, the cheapest connection to make. This is a connection, but it means it's simultaneously a connection from this bubble to two other bubbles. We pick that. That's the cheapest. Add in the unary cost for this node, write it in here, and proceed as usual. You've, you now know how to deal with trees. We'll just go through very quickly, right? Uh, these are our numbers. We do regular dynamic programming, regular dynamic programming. All the time here, you're always looking back at what are all the edges that could have come in here. And then when you get to N5, you do what we just said of looking up your, your three-way costs, choosing the cheapest one, and you get all the way to the right. Oh, sorry. Uh, here you go. So if we, let, let's do this mathematically very briefly, right? We said for, uh, well, let's use N3 because I can, I'm tall enough to point to N3. Um, 
the, accumul the accumulated cost for entry initially, the unary cost, uh, is just going to be the initial unary cost, which is this thing of um, whatever the unary cost was for each of those for each of those folks. For N4, we're saying, okay, it's going to be the unary cost for N4, whatever the unary cost is for that bubble, plus the minimum over L, where L is the choice of what was the previous W3 state that we're coming from. So we get to choose the L that minimizes this thing, where we're looking at W4 has to be K, and W3 is this thing that we're changing. So we're mathematically saying, I'd like you to adjust this L until we figure out which is the shortest, the cheapest path leading to this bubble. So it's a minimum, it's a minimum over L. Now when we have the three-way set up, now we have to do a minimum over L and N, right? So that's at node 5, we just said we have to look at what values is, is the fourth W going to take and what values is the second W going to take. Right. W2 gets some value, W4 gets some value. You get to mix and match and choose what, you, what is the cheapest. So clearly, if you have a tree which has, which from its root, branches not two ways, but three ways. Can you solve it using this algorithm? Yeah. You just need some four-way cost function. Some cost function that says, uh, okay, I know I have to split three ways. There are going to be let's say, three paths leading from the leaves on this end of the screen to, to that junction, right? So uh, let's look at the combinations of them and minimize, choose the minimum configuration of three variables, right? So obviously, uh, you know, we are growing, this is going to grow exponentially, so you don't want trees that have lots and lots of splits, but, uh, but we can certainly cope with it. And if Whatever, if you can minimize this, you can minimize the whole thing using dynamic programming. And of course, from there, we proceed uh, just regular dynamic programming to the, all the way to the right, then trace back, remembering that when you trace back, at the junction, you're not committing to one path, you're committing to sort of one com combination path, right? Com a path that says, Go to go there in W two and go here in W four. So, so what's the implication of this? What's the, what the question does this answer? Then? This answers the question: What is the optimal combination for world states, where the world states are de are dependent or conditionally independent of each other in a configuration that's not a chain but is a tree? Can't, you can't map that back to the disparity problem. Uh, you can map it back to the disparity problem. You could, for instance, say, uh, and we'll see an example of this uh, a little later, you could, for example, say, I'm going to have each pixel depend on, I mean, let me keep the, the sort of the layout the same. We're going to have each pixel depend on its predecessor pixel. So there's some disjoint relationship that we saw with chains. And I'm going to have each pixel depend on uh, maybe a neighbor to the north. So now I can have a given pixel that is, it's a family, I can draw it. Uh, I could say that this depends on this, and it also depends on something that happened in the pixel above, yeah? And I can keep going, uh, going along. There's a slight difficulty here that then this, these pixels can't be part of their own 
row, right? Because then we don't we no longer have uh, that sort of relationship. What we could do is we could draw this maybe this way. then you're getting yourself into all sorts of trouble, right? You have to figure out some sort of layout of the nodes so that this then, and you don't want too many connections here because of the reason we just stated, right? Uh, so that you can try to get two rows or multiple rows all being contingent on each other. The, the problem is that, uh, well, it's not a problem, let's say. That I'll, I'll show you an example of someone who's done this, uh, and it, it does help, but we have, in fact, a better solution for dealing with things that happen to be a grid. Okay, so you should, you should feel liberated now. You don't yet need to pose your problem just as a chain. You can uh, pose it as a tree and still use the, uh, the dynamic, dynamic programming you implemented yesterday. All right, now we're going to skip over maximum marginals. Uh, these are alternative ways with some flexibility uh, for doing, for dealing with the same tasks that we've dealt with. If you're more on the machine learning side, I think you might be interested to read those sections of the book uh, or go through the notes. I would like to get today to, to some applications as well. And so I'm going to skip forward to this question of the models with, with loops since that's what's, that's what's coming uh, shortly. So. so if you've got the notes and you are uh, keeping up with them, we are jumping, we are jumping here. Well, was with loops. Um, there is something called uh, and so we're, we're skipping uh, a, a few things here. I will just mention them so that you know to, to go there if you this comes up in your own work in the future. Uh, if you have an undirected graph that looks like this, uh, so this is, we've been using directed graphs, but we've always said, ah, oh, right, you could use the dynamic programming for directed or undirected graphs that are organized as chains, or the same is true for trees. Uh, there's one other sort of uh, structure that's called factor graphs, where something like this uh, becomes solvable by dynamic programming. The thing you should maybe notice is there's a connection there between W2 and W4, so that's not technically a tree, so you couldn't use the algorithm we just discussed. But uh, if you convert this undirected graph into a factor graph, which you're in, in summary, what you're doing is you're saying, oh, I'm going to, uh, to treat cliques as if they were their own sort of nodes, um, their own nodes for which I will estimate the state. And when you do that, that clique with W2, 4, and 5 in it uh, becomes this, this square here, and now you can use dynamic programming for it. The other, uh, the other thing you can use is belief propagation. So we will mention belief propagation again next week when we get to grids, uh, but I'm skipping it now because it, it doesn't add a whole lot of value for us uh, because regular belief propagation still requires chains or trees, and you already have a good solution for, for dealing with them. The, the expanded version of belief propagation, is, I'll just summarize now, is about sending messages uh, between your nodes. So rather than just computing everything sort of from left to right and saying, okay, give me the maximum, uh, sorry, give me the minimum cost path that leads to this node, you send messages to each of your neighbors and then repeat and repeat. Each of the neighbors are sending messages to each other. Uh, hopefully, but there's no guarantee, you see, this is why it's not, it's not an exact algorithm. Hopefully converging to a solution where you, um, well, to a, to a local minimum anyway, uh, of the configuration of all the states. So if you hear belief propagation, you know that you can look at the latter part of chapter 11 to, to sort of see the beginning of it, the, the vanilla version. 
and chapter 12, which we'll have next week, to see the, the more advanced version of it. Factor graphs, same, same thing, but mostly just in chapter 11. All right. Uh, we've mentioned that you can learn the parameters for your unary, pairwise, three-way costs, etc. Um, there are obviously supervised ways of learning it. What's interesting is there are also unsupervised ways of learning those costs. Uh, so we're not going to we're not going to dwell on that. It's um, pretty cool stuff. If you want to look up the Baumwolf algorithm, uh, it is of course typically I would say better to have supervised learning if you can, but not always do you have access to to training examples to help you set those to learn those parameters. All right. Uh, I've hinted already that we're next week we're going to move into grids. The reasons we can't do grids using dynamic programming. Well, we'll illustrate that in just a moment. Um, so don't despair, even though I'm going to tell you why we can't do this right now. Right? With what we have from yesterday, we can't, we can't do this, and this comes up quite a bit, either the directed version or the, or the undirected version. So uh, why can't we use dynamic programming? Well, it, it, it seems pretty clear. Right? If I set up a four pixel problem like this, I should be able to use dynamic programming. Now, I'll just start off here, and I'll say, I'll write in my unary costs, figure out uh, what is the cheapest path going from W1 to, I'll point again to the bottom one, to W3, uh, and I'll, uh, for, for each, of the, each of the bubbles in W3, I'll, I'll figure that out. I'll do the same thing for W2, and then we'll go to W4, which W4 looks at the rest of the problem and says, ah, right, I'm a, I'm a root. This is a tree. Clearly, I'm a root. I need to have a, a three-way cost. Great, I'll evaluate the three-way cost leading to me from W2 and W3. And uh, we settle on the, the second bubble from the top there. So everything is, is fantastic, right? What, why is this a problem? Well, if we trace back now, so the forward going, forward going was okay. If we trace back, and we say, yeah, okay. Uh, to reach that, we had to use the black bubble from both W2 and W3. And we trace back again. And uh-oh, they disagree. They disagree on what state W1 should be in. W2 says, yeah, give me k equals 2. W3 says, give me k equals 4. Now what? You don't, you don't have a solution. So we didn't converge. We applied the forward part of the algorithm, but we weren't able to fully apply the, the backwards part of the algorithm. Uh, right, so it's basically saying the same thing mathematically. Uh, we, we will have this, this cost, and they are, um, it turns out, not equal to each other, right? The, the, the accumulated, accumulated cost, cost S4, the sum of the costs that we get here, is not equal to the thing that minimizes what we computed when we were going for. All right, so not all is lost. If you, if you stopped attending this class today and didn't come back next week, didn't know how to do grids, uh, you could still do something, right? So you could take this grid graph and you could prune it. You could say, fine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock out all of the edges uh, that make this a grid that create loops, uh, and I'll create this tree structure, right? Look familiar, right? Trying to, to knock out some of those those edges. We we created a, a tree structure, and now we can apply uh, the dynamic programming. So that's that's okay. That's one one option. Uh, another option would be that we say, remember when we said, okay, we've got apple, no apple for a single pixel. Apple, no apple with two pixels. Well, we could just make this sort of a combined state, right? We could say that uh, we could rename 0, 0 as the, the first state, 0, 1 as the second state, right? And so we'd have sort of a, a fourth state uh, random variable. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. We're saying, all right, take the, take the state that W1 and 2 and W3 are in and just combine it into a, this, this combinatorial state, right? So, um, W, W, one, two, three, 
all put together is going to be more complicated. It's going to have uh, an exponential number of states compared to what each of these had on its own. But now it definitely looks like a chain. So we can definitely use dynamic programming for it. All right. Uh, if your problem has a fairly small number of states in each one of these, just like apple not apple, apple not apple, apple not apple, then maybe this is okay, although you know, probably not recommended for, for larger grids. All right. Um, loopy belief propagation, I've hinted at this. We will come back to that next week. Uh, it isn't guaranteed to converge, but works quite well in practice, and a lot of uh, very kind of cool research papers started being published in 2000 uh, that, were, that were using this, and, and we've been using it um, ever since. So not guaranteed to converge isn't always the end of the world, right? You can actually do some very attractive things with it. Sampling approaches. So uh, you can sample. I'll, I'll actually show an example of, uh, of sampling from uh, the posterior. So that, that will become maybe clearer there. And then tree reweighted message passing and graph cuts, which we will talk about next week. All right. So let me, let me illustrate what I was getting at um, with some of the applications. So we've got gesture tracking. I mentioned that starter, and uh, this is that is an inset there with a what's called an Elmo cam before Elmo was a was a character. I think it was before he was a character. Uh, inside of a uh, baseball cap. Step one: classify every pixel in the scene as we don't care about apples as skin versus not skin. Then. Look for connected components. So in your image processing, or even just built into MATLAB, there's something for uh, finding all of the pixels that are neighboring other pixels that are skin. Hopefully, you'll find just two regions that are roughly the right size and separated from each other. You fit an ellipse, just a 2D ellipse, to each of the collections of pixels that is skin. That way, you get some information about the hand, its, its size, uh, its orientation. But of course, it's approximate. The nice thing about it is it's very low dimensional. So you can store the information about the ellipse in a four dimensional vector, right? So x is 4D per hand, but you've got two hands, so it's 8D total, right? So you've got an eight, eight dimensional uh, set of real values that represents what is happening in the image. So you see we've gone from pixels to, that's our pre-processing, to get to x. And now we're asking, OK, so what is the word that was just gestured? So words themselves in American Sign Language, um, single word consists of uh, sort of a, a sequence of things, uh, a sequence of gestures. And in this case, uh, Thad modeled this as being um, as being four states. So he said, OK, there are four possible states. And he trained on, what was it? Uh, so it's a 40 word lexicon. Let me look this up. Right, 400 training sentences. And he trained 40 different words. So he had a separate, just like we had sort of a mixture of Gaussians for apples, a mixture of Gaussians for not apples. Here he trained a hidden Markov model, the one we were using for stereo. He trained one for the first word in the lexicon, he trained another one for the second word in the lexicon, and so on for 40 words in the lexicon. So then at test time, he was checking, he's looking at his vectors x, describing the two ellipses, and he was checking to see, OK, all 40 HMMs, each of you, I would like you to compute what is uh, the best, highest probability state that that you can, that with which you can explain the data. So we look at the posterior probability. Uh, if the first word was um, was goat, right? Then it would say, all right, I have been trained to recognize goat. The posterior probability of that sequence of x's that we observe being goat is the following number, and that would be this this sum uh, this sum cost converted into back into a probability. Right, because we could undo the, the log and undo the negation to say, all right, this is our this is our probability, or at least 
relative probability. And so the GOAT HMM, the Apple HMM, the, the uh, Caravan HMM, each of those HMMs comes back with a probability of, and says, yeah, the thing that we just saw, that video, uh, that's how, how well that corresponds to, to my word. And remarkably, this worked, uh, let's see, the percentage time was 97% accurate. Fantastic, right? That's great. Uh, this was 1998, and the thing ran at 10, 10 frames a second, uh, recognizing gestures. And it was trained on one person and tested on a different sign language person, which is also they're quite. Uh, it's quite easy to, to actually have different styles of, of signing. Now you could say, well, the vocabulary is only 40 words. Indeed, the, the accuracy is going to go down if you double or triple the, the vocabulary. Uh, but you you know exactly, you could go implement that now, right? There's nothing I've described to you, I hope, um, that's, that's difficult about it. Uh, you could just type it up into MATLAB and, and do it. MATLAB may not run 40, uh, 10 frames a second even now, but we'll see. All right, so uh, we've already talked about the stereo uh, problem. You've lived the stereo problem, so uh, hopefully everyone got it working reasonably well. Uh, the thing we talked about a little bit was, yes, this is what happens when you do maximum of likelihood for each of the pixels independently. This is what happens when you, this is the improvement. You're supposed to say, ah, ooh, this is the improvement. This is what we saw when we did dynamic programming. Fantastic. Um, if you did this type of thing and said, all right, I'm going to try to make trees out of this, this grid of pixels, uh, then you get this kind of solution. So this is what uh, Olga Wechsler did uh, in 2005. She's, uh, she and her husband were a big part of, of creating the graph cuts algorithm, which we'll get to uh, next week. So you can see they're thinking about, oh, right, it's all about uh, solving for these random variables jointly, right? So that, that um, these, areas, these areas of high confidence where we see detail, right, those can help us get good answers in the areas of low confidence where we don't have a lot of matching, right? Where, where in fact, uh, there's not a lot of action here telling us which disparity is, the, is better than, than the others. All right. So you should be seeing, well, that is indeed an improvement, right? We don't have the streaks. Did, it, did people see the streaks yesterday? Yeah. Yeah? OK, good. So you saw the streaks. Uh, so you, is the improved method only looking at single rows again? The improved method here is combining in ways, it's combining the pixels from a neighborhood and making a tree out of it. Right. So it is, it will look partly at a row but also north and south neighbors. Uh, and so we see, we see fewer streaks but still local, local areas here really, depending on the layout of the trees, right, will still get these, these flaws. I don't know if you remember the ground truth, but you can kind of see it from this, right? There ought to be pretty much this straight edge in here. It's sort of got the little uh, dinosaur uh, lumps on it. And bottom left as well. That's sure. And bottom left, well, this is one of those this ugly truths. We, we frequently do these sort of, uh, oh, let's just brush under the rug the fact that we don't know what to do at the border of the image. There's not a lot. If, if there's low confidence on, on matching what's going on here, what is in that image on that side? Let's, let's go back. <laughs> right, so there's some texture here, but there are fewer neighbors to connect those two, right? There's nothing out here. Um, then it's going to be more ambiguous, and ambiguity leads to pretty random results, uh, unless the nodes are connected to random variables that are unambiguous. Uh, that's just not the case down here. So, uh, but indeed, it, it's the tree, the tree structure has, has not actually helped here, but in fact hurt in that, in that lower left. I hadn't really noticed that before. Uh, okay, stereo. Now, pictorial structures. This is an interesting problem. It was quite a it was quite a development uh, when people started doing pictorial structures. Your task, let's say now, your task is to try to find the face, but not just to put a bounding box on the face. We want you to be able to register, let's say a. a figure out where the face is and register like a template face onto it. 
we want to know basically where are all the parts of the face, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. OK, if you hadn't been here all week, you would have said, ah, I know how to do this. I've seen classification, right? I've learned that I can take, um, I can take my vector x. Uh, I could make a classifier for it, right? Some kind of discriminative classifier. I just need to see a bunch of examples of uh, noses, right? And then uh, convert them into this feature vector x, train my classifier, and then I'll just run my classifier across the whole image until I find the areas that have sort of that are very nose-like. Uh, and if someone's really pushing me to make a decision, rather than just saying, "Oh, here's the probability of here's a probability map of where the nose might be, where that map might have a bunch of sort of different peaks," you would just what? What would you do, do then? Threshold. You can threshold, and then what? Now you've got several candidates that are you've got three candidates that are above the threshold. So we're talking about a probability map, let's just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we've got a probability map, size of that image, uh, and it's kind of a, you could think of it as, as a mountain range, right, with sort of areas that are, uh, that where higher means more probable, right? And now what do you do when you threshold? You've got, let's say, these three, three peaks are, are coming out. The most central one? You can go for the most central one. So you can come up with some measure. You could say, oh, I'm going to go for the most central one, or I was thinking the, just the highest one, the one that's just most like what I've learned in training. Uh, and either way, I think that's OK. You have located, you've done your best, you've located a, uh, a nose. OK? But notice that in this case, we're I'm also going to follow that up, and I'm also going to say, well, can you also find an eye, and the other eye? And uh, really, I, I would really prefer if the nose were kind of more central, and I would prefer if the, the one eye was up to the left and one, the other eye was up to the right. Basically, I've got a lot of these preferences that I'd like to, to express for you. Um, yeah, and could you do all those classifications, those detections that we, we talked about? Uh, can you do them all sort of in, in parallel? And even though something in the upper left might look a lot like a nose, don't get distracted by that. So dynamic programming to the rescue. We say, oh, right, I'm going to run my nose detector. It's going to, without the thresholding, uh, we're, we're just going to make a probability map over the whole image of how well we think each given location could be a nose. We're going to do the same thing for all the different parts you see here. The one corner of the mouth, the other corner of the mouth, the eyes, the, the corners of the eyes, and the, and the nose. OK. So we do that, and so we have a bunch of these probability maps. Uh, now, the tricky part. We have to figure out what is, how, what is the language in which our, our answer is going to come to us. So we want the world states, if we're going to use dynamic programming, we want the world states to be continuous or discrete. Discrete, right. Uh, so that, that corresponds to these sort of unique bubbles that we had for each W in our, in our dynamic program. Uh, the, the little circles that I explicitly said are not random variables. All right, so we, we want to discretize the world state. So we're going to say, OK, I'm going to make for each of my, for each of my elements, let's say the, the nose again, I'm going to say the nose can be in a number of discrete locations. And I'll just discretize pixel space. And I'll say, for each x, y location, that's a unique state of world nose. Right? The nose world variable basically can be at this x, y, at this x, y, at this x, y, all, a whole long list of x, y's. And that could just be the entire image. Or it could be some region in the middle of the image. Right, we just discretize that and say, OK, those are all possible locations of the, the nodes. And we do the same thing for each of them. All right. Are we, are we seeing where this is going now? Well, we put it into dynamic programming. We say, all right, uh, this looks like a tree. So what's, what's going to be the node on the far right? 
people who are pointing their nose, it's very good. That would be the nose, because that's that's the root of our tree. The leaves, the things that hang down when we when we grab the, the root, the leaves will all be on the left side. All right. Uh, to compute our unary cost, we see what did the nose classifier say, right? The nose classifier um, for different locations. Is this picture too busy now? Let's sort of start over. Um, let's just do it this way. I've got this window where I think the nose ought to be in an image. It ought to be at these, these locations, and I've just sort of listed nine pixel locations, but, but obviously we could sample this more densely. The list of possible values of w of state nose would just get longer. Right. And so we go, we say, if this is the center of the nose, uh, what did the classifier say is the posterior probability of, of this, these pixels here, the centered here, being a nose. That's our unary cost for that version of the state, for that bubble. And we have that for each of these. And we have that, that same kind of unary cost for each of the other parts. All right, so who wants to suggest something for the pairwise cost? Knowledge, how the eyes and nose are in relation to each other. That's right. So ideally, we might learn this, but if we don't have the ability to do it for, for some very good reasons, potentially, we could say, yeah, I, I'm going to say this thing, this this uh, lower right corner of the mouth. I'm going to say it could be at any one of these discrete locations. It can be sort of here, 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 here. I'm going to make this sort of map of possible locations where it could be. However, if it is down and left of the nose by a certain amount, you can think of it like a spring, that'll be lower cost than if it is down and to the right in sort of a Picasso face or something like that, right? And if it's down and down to the left by a lot, also going to be higher cost than sort of where I expect to find it. So if you have a lot of training images where you know what this sort of x and y offset ought to be, then this you can set the, the cost appropriately. And you can do that for each of the pieces, right? For each of the relationships of all of the pieces. Obviously, the trickiest one is the nose, because then you have to think about the relationship to all four sort of edges that are leading into it. OK, there you go. You can do face detection and face part detection, really, where imagine I do this to, to and, and get a picture taken of me covering on one of my eyes. Right? The detector for that eye is going to have a low unary, uh, I'm sorry, a high unary cost kind of everywhere. So it will be very ambiguous. But it might still work, because all of the other parts of the face will be localized really well. And it will say, uh, you know what? Overall, if I had, if I really pressed, I would guess that the, the eye that was covered up, well, I think it's probably over there. OK? This should, be, this should be cool, right? You should be saying, oh, right, OK, great. Finally, I don't have to treat every variable as being completely independent. They're not all, they're not all, not all codependent. They're, they're, they're just right, and, and I can control uh, I can control who's who's related to who. Pictorial structures doesn't always work uh, spectacularly well. It all depends largely on how you set up your problem. So uh, this body parts, right, should be kind of just like the face, essentially. But pre-processing is very important. So if we take our image, uh, this is our input image, but we also have a photograph of the stage uh, without anybody in it, so just an empty stage. We can do background subtraction threshold that, right? So we just are saying which pixels have changed, essentially. So we say, OK, those two pixels have stayed the same. These gray ones, these have changed. We're going to use these pixels when calculating our unary cost. The states that we use here, instead of discretizing sort of the pixel location of the center of the nose, right? Here we're going to say, OK, the center of the uh, the hand there, or whatever, the elbow. The center of the hand is uh, is actually, we're not going to worry about the center. We're going to just discretize the pose space. We're going to say the hand can be sort of uh, vertical, 
diagonal, horizontal, maybe some, same the other way, maybe facing forward, backward. So we'll just say, okay, there's a dozen states that the hand can be in. We discretize that, and we also discretize the, the location. So we've got quite a few discrete locations for the hand, uh, but nonetheless, let's say we are able to form this in the shape of, of a tree, just like we did for the face. But here for the unary cost, they said, okay, for a given pose of, uh, well, I was using elbow, for a given pose of the elbow, to evaluate the unary cost of that pose, go back to your image vector and see how much overlap is there between that 3D box, once it's projected to 2D, between that, those, that box and the gray pixels in this image. The more overlap there is, the lower the unary cost. Okay. Uh, anyone want to guess why that, where that might fail? It worked okay, but there were some problems. Where would there be problems? Occlusion. Occlusion. Very good. Anyone want to explain? Anyone else want to explain why occlusion would be a problem? Or guess? The hint is I, I'm going for each for each body part to compute its unary cost, ignoring all the other parts. I'm going to look at this image and say how much do the gray pixels overlap with where the the projection is of the of the body part. You get quite a high false negative. You get quite a high false negative. False negative is where we uh, ask if there's a, a limb there, and it says there isn't a limb there. Because it's you've got the something converse. in the way, so that when you. I think it would be the converse. It would give a lot of false positive because if you would hide your arm behind your body, then it would try to fit, uh, say, an arm in your torso, and it will see your torso, so there will sp still be a lot of... I think you're on the right track, track but it's... in front of you. Yes. So oh, another... static table, then that would be subtracted off, and then you'd have ah. bits missing from your legs. Very good. Uh, I think, uh, so, so I think both answers are, are perfectly acceptable. You have to throw it in the table, though, and then, then, I, then I'm with you. Uh, absolutely right. So if there's any occlusion due to, uh, you said occlusion, and they went, both went different ways on occlusion. Uh, very good. So, did, did everyone follow that, right? Yeah, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. yeah good. So, the, the idea is that if you take, you're, you're each holding a camera, you take a picture of the scene with nothing in it, right? But that, that's included, and you take a picture. Then I stand back here, and these pixels are always labeled as unchanged. So they would look white, and that means that even if you say, okay, what are the chances of the, the torso being at this location, right, you, you wouldn't see them. That's your version of occlusion. Uh, the other version of occlusion is, is the one I was actually thinking of, uh, is the one here where they, they put their arm or something in front of them, or they, they do this, right? And the same gray pixel here is basically supporting the, the unary, or, or reducing the unary cost for multiple body parts, right? Any mod body part that wants to ask, oh, is, is that is that me right there? Oh, could could I be right there? Everybody gets the answer. Oh yeah, sure. You 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 could all be in front of the same you know in the same gray pixels. Um, and so for for slightly more tricky combinations, uh, 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 pose combinations, you start getting this sort of unary cost, which biases things to be on top of each other. So there are there are some ways of dealing with it. Um, in this case, they tried sampling from the posterior. So basically, they said, OK, well, we'll have uh, each of these body part things happening on their own. But we will sample and say, OK, but we need, we need these parts to not overlap. right? So we'll sample from the possible space of world states. But we, we need, if your right arm is here, then we need your right hands to not be occupying the same, the same gray pixels. And that's what you're seeing here is sort of samples for, for the same image. We're sampling from the posteriors and, and seeing slightly different configurations. Some of them are sort of more obviously bogus than the other, right? So it says, hey, yeah, I, I can do this. We, we could agree on those gray pixels, but then there's more overlap. And so they're, here they're choosing solutions which have less overlap. All right, I have one last example, and then, then I'll let you go. Uh, the segmentation example, 
is, I think it's quite cool and quite important to illustrate the point about no loops, right? We have chains. Chains or trees, not loops. Your task here is to segment the, uh, the avocado pit. All right, so you say, great, uh, I just, the avocado pit is round. I'm gonna have to draw a circle around it or, or let the algorithm find the minimum sort of enclosing loop uh, that will enclose this, this avocado pit. So we're gonna make a bunch of nodes. These are just, these are just uh, nodes which will represent as a random variable which can have a location, <coughs> a discrete location of x, y inside of this box, right? This node can go anywhere here. The next one can do the same, the next one can do the same, and so on. Because we're not allowed to have loops, we can only have chains. What we're doing here is we're going to first lock this one to be in a given position, and lock this one to be in a given position. Think of these as not random variables, but just fixed locations. And that's, let's say, the beginning of the chain. The chain continues, and then the chain ends. And what we do is dynamic programming, same as you've done already to optimize the location of each of these nodes inside of each of its blue boxes. And when you're done, you have a solution for what is a good chain that goes around the avocado pit, subject to this being here and this being there. Now, for the unary cost, we're saying we would like to position this, this, this dot at a place that has a high gradient. We don't like putting the segmentation boundary somewhere in the middle of the avocado's uh, flesh there where it, it's nice and smooth. We want, we like high gradient. So, so penalize low gradient or, or reward uh, high gradient. And for the pairwise term, they simply chose, they said, look at your previous node. So if we're, we're working, you know, in the sort of standard way from left to right, look at the world state before you and measure the distance. We like small distances, not big distances. Which means that the favorite configuration, if you had no unary cost or a uh, uniform unary cost, would be for this world state to be in the lower right-hand corner and this world state to be in the upper left-hand corner. Because that would minimize the distance. Now we can pre-compute that, right? Because we can say, all right, we have a bunch of discrete locations here, we have a bunch of discrete locations here, just like we pre-computed it for the stereo example, we would do that here. Notice what's interesting though. That's if you only had two nodes. Would we choose the lower right here and the upper left here? But as soon as we have a third node, what's going to happen? What's going to happen specifically to this, this uh, circle in the second in the second region, search region. It's got to choose a world state. It's got to choose a world state that makes its pairwise cost happy, but it has a pairwise cost with its predecessor and its successor. So what's going to happen? You're going to distribute? It's going to distribute. It's going to say, well, I would love to be in this one's going to say, I would love to be in the upper left so I could be really close here. But that's not going to get chosen as the shortest path overall through our dynamic programming uh, problem. Because if it did that, if it went to the upper left, then it would be very, very far away from anything in this, in this ver random variable. So it ends up kind of going halfway in between. Not necessarily halfway, halfway, right? Because it's also got to respect the unary cost, which says, please stick to the stick to the gradient, stick to the sharp edges in the intensity. But it, thereby, it, it will be pulled to sort of the middle because our dynamic programming is doing is solving this problem in submodular steps. It says solve the local problem, solve the next local problem, and then when we come back, we are always going to get the global solution, not just the local solution. So All right. For a round object, it would be better to look at the cost of the angle, pairwise cost of an angle, try and make that consistent. If you know, for example, it's a round object, exactly, our current pairwise cost that we've just been describing basically is set favoring uh, small objects. A a and that's, you're, you're absolutely entitled to say, that's not my problem. I want to solve the round object problem. I want to find bubbles in fluid, which people have asked me to do before. And you say, ah, oh, in that case, I really want to reward roundness, right? 
And so you could make your pairwise cost try to respect rounders. The last thing I'll say, and then you can go, is the, the idea here. Remember, we said this, this was quite arbitrary. We picked these two nodes and said, I'm going to nail those to the image, and I'm going to solve everything else subject to those constraints. But what you could do now is you could say, fine, I'm going to solve that problem the way we have, right? Now you see it's converged a little bit. This one's moved up to the left. This one's moved a bit. This one's moved. So they've all kind of gone where they can, and we have a solution for that initialization. Now we're randomly going to pick two other nodes to be pinned where they are. We leave them where they are and optimize the rest to get this result. So after just pinning sort of one pair and then a second pair, we've got, I think, a pretty good edge walking around, walking around the, uh, the avocado pin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, see you guys on Tuesday. Thank you.